Luke chapter 16 this evening, reading one verse. We'll back up and read just a few others in this chapter. Again, I said I was titling the message Professional Sports and Olympics. And uh, I don't know whether we're going to overtime tonight or not. Notice with me as we read from verse 15. I'll back up and read just a few other verses in a moment. Notice as we come here to verse 15. He said unto them, You're they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Heavenly Father, we do ask this evening, as we did this morning, we ask your blessings upon our time together. Lord, we thank you again for this privilege, this opportunity to assemble together. And Lord, we just pray again, thy will to be done, and we ask all of these things in Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have preached a number of sermons over the years on this subject. Here are just a few. Entertainment in 2009, it's in transcript and booklet form. Sports, 2006, it's in also in article form. The Olympics in 2010, it's also in article form. Football, 2010. Super Bowl Sunday, 2010. Bread and Circuses, 2019. Uh, War series, and all of this will tie together one way or the other, about 12 sermons there. And then martial arts in 2015, we have a booklet and an article on that. I want revival in my life and in my church and my country. And I believe that you want the same thing. What we want to talk about tonight is not necessarily getting out in the backyard and have, enjoying each other's company and and playing uh, games. I'm not really talking about that unless they turn stupid and people start arguing and debating. That's when it needs to stop. But we want to talk about basically professional sports. Um, I could even back it up to high school, college, and of course uh, uh, national. But you notice with me as we come here, and you can write down First Thessalonians 5.20. I read that last week despise not prophesying, that is, despise not the preaching of God's Word. Now, sports is one of America's gods, there's no doubt about that, and it is contrary to biblical Christianity, and it is not innocent fun or entertainment. Now, we're talking about organized sports or professional sports. It did not originate in the church of Jesus Christ. We know that for sure, and I'll prove that a little later. In the 1800s, Charles Spurgeon made this statement, and it's amazing. It sounds like it ought to be made today. He said, this is the age of excessive amusement. Everybody craves for it like a babe for its rattle. In the more sober years of our fathers, men and women had something to live for better than silly sports. We just um, heard about the summer Olympics in France just in recent weeks, and in just the weeks to come, we'll start a new season uh, of football, especially around the 1st of September. High school football will start, college football will start, and shortly uh, the national leagues will start. We know that sports is big business uh, in America year-round. Uh, You can go uh, from football to basketball to races to golf to tennis to baseball, and you give a long list of this. It never ends. In any time of the year, you have some types of sports going on. Nothing gets more publicity today than sports, both locally and worldwide. Large crowds gather, and players are idolized, and they really are around our country. You notice in our text here this evening, he says in verse 15 again, chapter 16, verse 15, and he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. I'm interested in the phrase here, highly esteemed among men, And God said it is an abomination. In other words, we find here that this is the verse that you can gauge things by 
and I've tried to use it for many years in my Christian life. In other words, if the world loves it, the Lord probably hates it, and vice versa. And we find that sports is highly esteemed today in our culture. Nobody will deny that, whether Christian or non-Christian. Fans come from the thought of uh, fanatics, and we find that here that he said that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. In other words, an abomination is things that God detests and things that God hates. Now back, in, back up with me, verse 13. He said in verse 13, No servant can serve two masters, for either will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. In other words, here's the choice between two masters. You cannot have them both. You will not serve them both. One master will take the prominent place, no matter how we look at it. It has to be Christ, or it's going to be the world. You can't have both at the same time. Turn with me to Jeremiah, and notice with me in Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. I'll be fumbling through papers tonight and picking out what I want to read and not read in quotes. And, uh, and I want to mainly quote from my articles, and I've got a few other things maybe. But notice in Jeremiah chapter 10, I want to read just one verse. The entire chapter is dealing with the heathen, the pagan, and idolatry. And I'm going to read in verse 2. Notice with me as we come here to verse 2. Now, 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 4, you can write down. This is not quoting the whole text, but it said, This know also that in the last days, of course, he speaks of perilous times, but he also says there's lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And that's what we see in the sports uh, industry. As a matter of fact, it's interesting to me that it's not really the lost that want to debate and argue with me over this subject. It's Christians, and that's sad. The lost will just tell me, yes, you're right. It's, um, it's got immorality and aggression and pridefulness. They'll just, many of them will just admit it. It's the Christian that will want to argue with you on this subject. The recent Summer Olympic Games in France, I got a few phone calls and a few people that I know locally, and uh, different ones had said, uh, did you see it? I said, no, I didn't even know it was going on until you told me. And, uh, and I said, why are you watching it? A couple of friends of mine, I asked them, I said, why are you watching it? They talked about the mockery of the Last Supper and men participating in women's sports and things of that nature. I don't care. I don't care what they do because I don't believe men or women should be participating in any sports, and especially the Olympics, and you'll know why when I get into the uh, aspects of it. I wrote an article. Don't let me forget to read our text here. wrote an article... And just bear with me with this. I'm going to read just a few things. I want to first of all just talk about the Olympics and then come back and talk about just sports in general. And I could stand here for three hours tonight easily. I don't want to do that, and you don't want me to do that. But this is a subject that I had to leave most of the stuff in my office. I got a stack this high of material uh, that I could bring to you. I've got two pretty large books, one written by Christians, the other one written by the secular world, and both of them many times come to the same conclusion about pridefulness, immorality, aggression, and so forth in the sports industry. So it's coming from two different angles, and I've hung on to these two books. But when we consider the Olympics, according to the world, the Olympics is the most important athletic event involving many different sports with competitors from nearly every nation on earth since 1896. These games are attended by millions of people and are watched by even more on television. These activities are filled with prideful carnality, vanity, covetousness, nudity, paganism, and the breaking of the Sabbath. And I could use 20 or 30 more synonyms, and so could you. 
on these articles, sports and Olympics, and also the transcript, the booklet on entertainment, I put Luke 16, 15 on each one of these, and also I added a few other scriptures as well. But when we consider the Olympics, the origin of the Olympic Games, this is from my article. Some of this, my, some of my own words, some of it's quotes by other authors. But the modern Olympics are named after the ancient Greece, Greek sporting events held from 776 B.C. to 394 A.D. The first recorded Olympic game or games took place in Olympia, Greece in 776 B.C., even though it is believed the games were played much earlier. The recorded Olympic games lasted 1170 years and we find that the ancient Greek civilization gave the world the institution of athletic and organized sports as an art form on par with the arts of architect, sculpture, poetry, theater. Uh, we also find that Alexander the Great in the fourth century um, promoted sports among the people. A sports hero in Greece was a religious figure and would be elevated and praised and worshipped. They received money, benefits, and fame. Sounds like the time in which we live. The games ended in 394 AD when a particular Roman emperor forbade all pagan worship. As Christianity grew, the games faded. Now that's interesting, isn't it? As Christianity grew, the games faded. The church continually spoke out against the Olympics and other sporting events in the Roman Empire. Early church writers during the first 300 years of church history gave much warning about sports. The Olympic Games became non-existent for 1,500 years until their revival in 1896. That was the origin of it. The paganism associated with these games, and I'm, again, I'm just going to quote from an article. This is back and forth with just my words and other people's words. But many today say that our modern Olympics are only about sports. If so, then why are the opening ceremonies becoming increasingly pagan, glorifying ancient religions in which we will illustrate? This is the very reason the games were banned in the 4th century A.D. The ancient Olympics had their roots in religion, honoring pagan deities. The games at Olympia were in homage to Zeus. Winners of the games gave sacrifices at the temple of Zeus. The Olympic games were sacred to the Greeks, for they were a religious act in honor of deity. To illustrate this, the paganism in modern Olympic Games, considering the opening ceremonies in 1996 at Atlanta, Georgia. Now this is, uh, would be, most of this would be a quote, if not all of it. They gave homage to Zeus. This is in Atlanta, 1996. They gave homage to Zeus. A portable silhouette temple was created with 50-foot pillars. There was also a high priestess there to cast her silhouette in front of the ceremonial light. With over three billion people from around the world watching this event, Dick Enberg, NBC sports commentator, spoke of the ceremonies. He spoke of the five Olympic spirits that called the tribes of the world to Atlanta, the global family. He described the procession of athletes, and priestess and the giant column which formed the temple of Zeus. As the athletes bowed to Zeus, Enbert explains, now the tribute to the supreme Greek god in whose honor the Olympics were once held, as the athletes appear magically, a 50-foot temple will be erected as the priestess carry offerings for Zeus. The lights dim and darkness represents 1,500 years when the games were forgotten after a loud sound in bird states, and now the five Olympic spirits awaken calling for rebirth of the modern games. So we see the origin of the Olympics is totally wicked and pagan. 
We see the paganism that's associated with it. That is seeing more and more of it now. And then, last of all, the worldliness of this. And I'm going to come back to some verses I gave you this morning. The Bible defines nudity quite different than the world. One only has to look at the swimmers, the ice skaters, etc. to see an array of nakedness. Many of the Greek athletes participated in the ancient Greek games and the nude and modern Olympics are not far from that. There is also the issue of many injuries and even deaths during games, uh, not only in other sports, but also in this. The following is taken from an article summoning the Olympic spirit. The origin of athletic games lie in the ancient world where they were treated as a ritual festival, especially in Greece. The temple of Zeus at Olympia was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It contained a gold and ivory statue of the god that was more than 40 feet high. You can read the rest of the article. We got much more in it than just that. So as we come to this, we see very clearly that the Olympics are pagan, they're wicked, they're worldly, it's idolatry, it's sinful, there's nudity, there's blasphemy, uh, there's uh, carnality, and they're vain. And there's many other synonyms we could use. Now, notice as we come here to this passage, and we, and we find here that he says in verse 2, he said, Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. A point in reading this, he says, learn not the way of a heathen. Again, we find in what I just quoted, the heathen admit the idolatry and so forth in, in these games. But it's the Christians that will try to want to deny this and Christianize everything and baptize everything so that they can participate in them or watch them. Turn with me to um, the book of um, uh, Galatians. I'm trying to decide, on, I'm pick and choose where I want to go. Um, notice in Galatians uh, chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And notice here, we read this a few times in the last month or so, but I want to read it again. See, the spirit of these events are contrary to the spirit of Christ. And there's really no way to get around this. By the way, really, I want to go to Philippians. I'm sorry. I, I, I'll just give you what's in, in, in Galatians. I want to go to Philippians too. I think this is the best. I'll give you the others in just a moment. But notice here in uh, Philippians 2. This is a passage I read many times throughout a year for particular reasons. We see that Christ is our example in humility, obedience, lowliness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, putting others before us, and none of these things are true in professional sports or the Olympics. Now James 4, 6 says that God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is this, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. None of, the, none of those things are in sports. None of those things. Now, I'm going to be reading in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8, parallel passages in 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23, where Christ is our example, and we see how he responded uh, when he went to the cross. And also Romans 12, verse 10 and verse 16, shows us to put others before us. You can't do that trying to knock somebody down on a football field. Can't do that. You can't be obedient to the fruit of the Spirit and following Christ trying to do that to somebody else. Now notice in, in, in Philippians, we'll read here, then we're going to go to 1 John. And he says here in Philippians chapter 2, and as I read, I just gave you some of the words. But I want you to notice, as we read through this, the words that are so important that are foreign to the sports arenas. He said in verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. 
But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation. Can I read that again? But made of himself no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. There's several words here. You don't need anything else to see that the sports, not just our modern day sports, but from the very beginning was wicked and contrary to the word of God. Now notice as we turn to 1 John. In 1 John in chapter 2, I made mention of this this morning. 1 John and in chapter 2. I'm going to be reading from verses 15, 16, and 17. Now, we wrote an article in 2006 on sports. And I'm just going to quote just a little bit from this. And before I quote this, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 18 through 20, tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, bought with a price, and are to glorify God in our body. We find in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16 through 18, the doctrine of separation. We are the temple of God and commanded to come out from among the world and touch not the unclean thing. I'm not quoting them verbatim now, but this is verbatim. Chapter 7, 1 in 2 Corinthians says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We have been called upon to separate ourselves from worldly things. And I'm going to give you a definition again here in just a moment of the world. Quoting from the article, The Origin of Sports. The highly competitive spectator sports was born in pagan societies that worshipped the creature more than the creator. The deification of reason and the glorification of the body. This athletic mentality did not originate in the house of God. In Hebrew history, athletics are as we know it today, cannot be found. Among the Hebrews, God's covenant people, what we see today and what we've seen in Greece and Rome cannot be found among them. These were foreign to the Jewish culture until influenced by the Greeks and Romans. In Scripture, we do not find gymnasiums or competitive sports. It was not until after the conquest of Palestine by Alexander the Great that sporting games were introduced among the Israelites. Even though Alexander the Great died at 33, his legacy is seen in the Middle East as well as other places in architect, in public building, in, in public buildings, gymnasiums, for games, and open air theater. It was the Greeks that built a gymnasium at Jerusalem for the use of competitive sports, and the Romans continued these events when they rose to power. The Romans became obsessed with amusement, erecting their coliseums, circuses, and theaters for the pleasure of their citizens. The gladiator shows were highly attended among the Romans. In these events, the people took great pleasure in the brutalizing of others when they were thrown to the wild beasts in the amphitheaters. The early Christian fathers did not speak against bodily exercise, but did speak against the vainglory of competitive sports and public games. Humanism was a religion of pagan cultures that led to great emphasis on uh, competitive spectator sporting events, 
America is highly influenced by the Greeks and Romans, especially in our day. In most capitals around our country, there are statues of naked gods and goddesses, and many of our buildings are designed after their ancient culture. And again, I'm quoting here from another um, article that I think I just mentioned in the Olympics. One other quote I'll give you here. It said, the word gymnasium actually comes from a Greek word meaning to exercise naked. Also, the following quote is taken from the book, A Generation Which Knew Not the Lord. The word for athletes come from the Greek goddess Athena. She was known as the goddess of wisdom, skill, and warfare. The Greeks' love for sports was a natural overflow of their love for their gods. In the peak of their political might, the Greeks saw humanity as something to be indulged in as far as their development of human reason and the human body. A true discovery of the individual, humanistic to say the least, the gymnasium of Athens was the center of advancing, learning, and intellectual as well as athletic ability was the measure of a man. And there's much more here. I just put a few quotes uh, in this. Now, talking about sports just in general at this present time, many of our sports in our country is associated with breaking the Sabbath, gambling, rock music, covetousness, aggression, and nudity. Now, there's no way to get around this. Sports are like a drug. They're addictive, and people can never get enough of it. Sports industry in Hollywood both are full of immorality, and you're letting sodomites entertain your family when you participate in this and watch it. In all of these areas, they say, oh, no, they're not in football. There's a lot of them in football and every level. So you're letting sodomites entertain you. I want you to listen to just a few things here. Don't let me forget to read in 1 John and give you these verses again I gave this morning. George Allen, now I'm talking about now aggression and violence, brutality. George Allen, a coach, said this is a violent sport. That's why crowds love it, the Green Bay Packers. Historian Baker In his final analysis, the new violence in sports stem from the assumption that winning is everything. Woody Hayes, coach of the Ohio State University years ago, we teach our boys to spear and gore. We want them to plant that helmet right under a guy's chin. I want them to stick that mask in the opponent's neck. Lombardi, I believe his name, a coach, years ago. Football is a violent game. To play, you have to be tough, physically tough, and mentally tough. Another football coach says, football is organized destruction. And I have many other quotes. I just brought you a few here here tonight. Notice with me now, as we come here to this passage, He says here in 1 John chapter 2, and I'm going to read verse 15, 16, and 17. This has to do with the world. The world here is the world of sin, as I mentioned this morning, that organized system led by Satan, which is in rebellion against God. This is not the world of creation, the birds and the plants and uh, the stars and so forth. This is not the world necessarily of just mankind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But we're talking about right now the world of sin. The context will always tell you which it is. This is the world of sin led by Satan, which includes the sports industry and the Olympics. It says here in verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that are in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that abideth, I'm going to back up, he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. There's three divisions of the world that are given here, and we've got entire sermons on this. The lust of the flesh, 
the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. There's the three areas that make up what we would call the world of sin that is headed up by Satan, uh, which is in rebellion to God and His Word. Now here's some of the other verses, if you want to just write these down. Again, I gave, I think, most of these this morning. 1 John 5, verses 19 and 21. 1 John 3, verses 1 and verse 13. And 1 John 4, verses 4 and 5. James 1, 27. Keep ourselves unspotted from the world. James 4 and in verse 4. If we are a friend of the world, we are an enemy of God. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world. John 15, 18 through 20, the Lord told his disciples in the night before the crucifixion, he tells them, he said, I'm going to leave you in the world. You're not a part of this world. He said, the world will hate you because they've hated me, but they were to minister to those that were in the world. 2 Timothy 4, 8, Demas forsook the ministry and the Lord and the Apostle Paul because of the world. And Mark chapter 4 and verse 19 speaks of the cares of this world. And then we also find the issue of idolatry and covetousness as idolatry. And uh, we find even in the book of Ezekiel chapter 14, beginning around verse 3, that there are those in that day had idols in their hearts. It's not just a statue you bow down to. I do have this taken from February the 6th, uh, 2005. A big, huge um, trophy. I mean, a huge trophy with a football player. Number one written on his jersey. Got cash in one hand, the football in the other. And all the people are bowed down uh, before him, this came out of the paper, and it's called the American Idol. This was the newspaper, Mobile Press, February the 6th, 2005. And there's a father and son here, and the father's pointing to the idol, and he says this, he says, it's why God made Sunday's son. And even though many wouldn't say that, they believe that. Now, coming back to this subject here of of the world, I believe that every Christian should make it their study to find out all the verses that deal with the world and vanity and things like that so we can know what is of Christ and what is not of Christ. I think that should be an ongoing study in our Christian life. I know that as a preacher approaching 72 years of age, nearly 42 years in the ministry, I continue to study this and look at it. Well, notice with me in Isaiah chapter 5, the book of Isaiah in chapter 5. In Isaiah chapter 5, and I want to read from verse 20. There's several verses that are important here. I preached a message in uh, 2019 titled Bread and Circuses. You'll have to go to the sermon if you want to know what that means, but I will say just a brief uh, comment on it. Bread and circuses was a phrase used by a Roman writer who lived in the first century, really 55 AD to uh, 135 AD. He spoke of the decline of the Roman society, and the only two things people desired was bread and circuses. Today it's pizza and football. And the Roman government kept the people happy with food and fun so that they would not be concerned about wars and scandals and corruption and abortions and wickedness and things of that nature. They kept them happy, gave them many holidays. This system that provided a distribution of food and a variety of pleasures through sports, competitions, plays, theater, shows, gladiatorial games, chariot races, public baths, banqueting, and so forth. In other words, the Rome went from a republic to an empire and reduced to bread and circuses. That's the history of Rome. And America has went from a republic and headed down the same road. I think we're already there, really. 
In Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, I want to read this, and we'll turn one other place and close. He said here in verse 20, now again, you need to really read from verse 18 through 25, because the judgment is in verse 24 and 25. But I'm picking out one thing. Yeah, in verse 18, a hasten to sin. Verse 20, distorting truth. Verse 21, uh, 22, I guess, uh, corruption and judgment. And then God's judgment, verse 24 and 25. But notice verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them. In other words, judgment will eventually come upon them as in verse 24 and 25. Turn with me back to the New Testament and notice with me as we come to the New Testament, Second Peter in chapter 1, Second Peter chapter 1. God put a difference between Israelites and the Egyptians. And there should be a difference between the Christian and the world today. Amen. Titus 2, 11 through 14 tells us how that we're to live in our society. James 4, verses 8 through 10 also speaks of repentance and humility and, uh, and speaks of faith. In other words, uh, forsaking sin. I'm going to tell you tonight, there's many things that will rob us of spiritual life. And one of the things in our society in the professional sports, any of these things, it will rob people of their spiritual life. And you can look at them and tell the difference. You can tell where they're at in their Christianity. Now notice in Second Peter, I'm coming to chapter 1. This is where we're clo we'll close. Sports always arouses the old nature or the old man that we preached on last week. We talked about the old man and the new man. Put off the old man, put on the new man. And I'll show you clearly that people love aggression and brutality. I'm going to show you and prove to you that that is so. Let all the leagues go to flag football and see how many follow it for the next 10 years. Flag football. It'll die in three years or less. It'll die. Colleges are known by their sports programs. In about two or three weeks, we'll start seeing this stupidity. There'll be fly, flags flying every Saturday down this road right here, nearly every house down this road. Colleges teach against everything that we believe the National Football League, high schools, everything that we believe and hold dear and precious to our hearts, colleges are teaching the opposite of that. Go to any college now and you will find the gay, I don't like to use that word because it's a good word, but you'll find the gay agenda in every secular college across our land, even in Alabama and Auburn. You'll find it there. So when you follow it and support it, you're supporting sodomy, is what you're doing. Churches 50, 60 years ago used to preach against this. We hardly ever hear anybody, preacher friends of mine, tell me I'm crazy for doing it. You can't ever build a big church doing that, and they're right. But it's wrong not to preach on it. Can you imagine the satanic mu music in, in these sports and the half shows and then the bands and the beating of the drum? It sounds like you're going to war. And can you imagine a wife letting a husband sit down and watch a game and the naked cheerleaders? God defines nakedness different than we do. It's not just our private parts. It's a whole lot more than that. And people say, well, it builds character. One of my friends used to be my friends, pastor friends. He, was, he played football for the military and he also coached. And he had the worst temper of anybody I've ever been around. And I talked to him about that many times. And he'd always tell me, football builds character. No, it tears down character. It destroys a human being. And he proved it every time he lost his temper. 
You can't love your neighbor and at the same time knock him down and try to hurt him. You can't do that. Notice as we come here to this passage. Oh my, i got so many other things here. Have you got a few more minutes? Oh, I don't like to read a lot of stuff. I like to just go to Scripture and make comments and keep moving. Where do I want to start? Like I told you, I only brought in about three hours worth. I guess we are going in overtime. Um, the pub, the Greek, the ancient Greco-Roman world. Public entertainment dominated the Roman Empire from the first century until the end of the empire of the sixth century, and the public amusement were of pagan origin, originally connected with the festivals of the gods, even though some had lost their religious connection. Tertullian says the plays represent it as the temple of Venus and Bacchus, who were close allies as patrons of lust and drunkenness. Scipion said, one of the, these early church writers, idolatry is the mother of all public amusements. Early church writers for the first 300 years, they gave warning about entertainment, theater, stage, plays, dramas, think about the television today, sporting events, races, gla uh, gladiators, Olympic games, boxing, wrestling, banqueting, drunkenness, and gluttony. They wrote extensively about this. I have a lot of their quotes. Even candidates for church membership and baptism and coming to the Lord's table were questioned if anyone was an actor, an athlete, players for prizes, comedian, magician, gladiator, or trainer, jugglers, Olympic gamesters, boxers, wrestlers in the military, uh, uh, or if your job had anything to do with idols, making or selling them. They were very serious about this. The theater. The theater would have to do with stage, plays, actors, operas, drama, musicals, like our television today. It was central in the lives of the ancient Romans. The Caesars made provisions for the theater to appease and satisfy the people. In Ephesus, we've been preaching a lot from the book of Ephesians. In Ephesus, the main road led directly to the theater. Read about that in Acts 19.29. Many theaters throughout the empire of the Romans. The themes in these theaters was just like today on television and movies. Comedy, crime, revenge, sexual immorality, uh, indecent language, and murder. That's exactly what's on most programs today. The drama arts took its rise in Athens amid the orgies of Bacchus. The Roman theater was mostly a copy of the Greek theater. The Roman stage was essentially a pagan institution and remained such in spirit long after the triumph of Christianity. As a general rule, the theater was the largest building in the city and was used for other purposes. Now listen to this. We have no desires to read uh, Aristotle, Plato, or Socrates, do we? We don't believe there are any Christianity in them whatsoever. But listen to this. We find that Socrates and Plato both oppose theatrical performances as hostile to morality. Plato said, plays rise, plays rather raise passions and pervert the use of them and the consequences are dangerous to morality. Plato said, plays are written merely to produce pleasure that that average men are trained by them to become lovers of pleasure. Aristotle said the seeing of plays and comedies should be forbidden to young people. And then lawmakers at one time exiled the founder of the stage from Athens. Circuses, not what you think today as circuses. Circuses in the first century were the chariot races. If anybody's ever seen Ben-Hur, very similar. I don't recommend going seeing that, but I've seen it many years ago, and there'd probably be a lot of similarities. The name circus is the Latin word for circle. There, these were held in the Circus Maximus, 
The emperor himself was usually present at the games and races. Circum Maximus was probably the largest sports arena ever constructed, initially seating 150,000 people, uh, 150,000 people, and later reconstructed between 100 and 104 AD, seating 250,000. A quote, the races took place, let me back up here, the races that took place had precise rules that resulted in violence much appreciated by the public. In other words, they wanted to see that. We think about the circuses and this uh, uh, races. We think about the large speedway today that seats uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, in other words, that's what comes to my mind when I see this. The gladiator, gladi gladiatorial combat games were usually held in amphitheaters called the Colosseum, built in four years from 69 to 81 A.D. by slaves. Um, these were just horrific. With uh, They used uh, many times uh, prisoners of war and slaves and criminals, criminals, and they had plenty of them because of the Romans fighting the wars. And even Christians died in these places. They were brutal, but the people loved it. They loved to see people knocked down. They loved to see people hurt, just like people like to see it today. It's not quite to that extent. Inhumane and br brutal in the arenas. Thousands of men and animals died yearly. In the arena, murder was practiced as an art. Man and beast sacrificed to the blood of thirsty crowd. In the inauguration of the Flavian Amphitheater, five to nine thousand wild beasts were slain in one day. Even Christians died in this Colosseum. The Colosseum, or Amphitheater, is one of the most visited tourist sites in the world today. Millions go to see the remnants of it each year. Uh, again, um, it, it's, just, it's just wicked stuff. One other thing, um, I don't need to go here with this. I've already mentioned the, the football and so forth. And this would include boxing. Uh, if you like boxing, you need to get saved. And if you like wrestling, you not only need to get saved, you need to have your heads examined. Amen? One other quote, and we'll read here and close. This is taken from a book, Safely Home. Academic and athletic competitions were the cornerstone of the Greek vision for training supermen. The worship of the body and the exaltation of human reason were indispensable components of the Greek philosophy. Their countless festivals and competitions were driven by an intense religious passion for their pagan faith and optimism in the per perfectibility of man. It was in the context of religious worship and its relationship to athletic and culture that the gymnasium was birthed. Another purpose of the Greek gymnasium was to create an entire nation of soldiers who could serve the state and further its interests. Thus, the ancient Olympic dream had as much to do with preparing warriors for the state as it did with uh, athleticism. The doctrine of the military state has long been with man. It was a critical part of the ancient world. And Hitler loved sports because it helped create and train young men and women for the Nazi army. Well, let us close in Second Peter chapter 1. Here in Second Peter chapter 1. I'm reading, uh, I'm coming down to verse 5 through 7, and uh, he gives promises, four promises, I think, in verse 3 and 4, then he tells us how to live. He said in verse 5, and besides, beside this, rather, giving all diligence, in other words, make it your business, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, that is self-control, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Seven things that were to add to our faith. And he said this, 
Verse 8, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But, now he talks about if they are not in us, but he that lacketh these things, what's the next word? Is what? Blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So the Lord is very serious about these doctrines and these truths. And there's no way that we can truly follow Christ and follow the sports industry in our country and in the world. Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you tonight again for your love and mercy to us. Thank you for your word. And Lord, we pray tonight that, our, that thy will to be done in each of our lives. For it's in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.